one second. Hello? Oh, there he is. Here he is. Hey, Bill. <laughs> Hello. Hey, Bill. Uh, we can you, see, we can see uh, your crotch. You? Yeah, yeah, we can see your crotch. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. Hey. Let me see if I can't fix this. This is really complicated because my screen is so thin. <laughs> I did this on a meeting last week and it wouldn't fix either. Okay. I thought I had it fixed. I've had it fixed before. Let me try something else. Okay. How's that? That's a little better, right? Why is it doing? Let me look up. There we go. Great. Uh, your screen is frozen now. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, uh, but yeah. you. The frozen. image is frozen. Um, for some reasons, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, okay. <laughs> now it's only gone. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I don't know why it's doing this. I'm going to go to another system. I'm going to log out and go to another system. Oh. Sure, sure. Okay, no problem. No problem. No problem. No problem. Um, also, uh, Adrian, uh, sometimes your audio is no, so kind of disrupted. Yes, from time to time. I, I, think I should, it... I'll take this off. I think I'll use the normal microphone. Uh, oh yeah, maybe the Bluetooth is um, not or so maybe good. it's a Bluetooth issue. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, let, let me just let me just uh, turn this off. I'll just use the normal. Is, it, is that is that better now? Uh, this is yeah. This is much better. I I I think. Yeah, yeah. I think sometimes the Bluetooth you uh, get some. Uh, um noise bluetooth yeah so i'm uh, so we're moving moving into a new apartment today in in adelaide my hometown because uh, oh, I, I've, been, I've been living like a nomad for more than six months uh america and queensland and everywhere uh, yeah. but i think uh uh i just, I just accept i'm just gonna accept the fact probably japan uh won't open up for a while i might my, my gut feeling is uh, mm -hmm. these pol the politicians in very high up? They're going to close until the Olympics is finished because they just want the Olympics to absolutely have no trouble. So I feel that uh, I have a feeling they're going to let people in only after the Olympics. Is is my yeah? No. I think that's possible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that's what they're saying in the back the back rooms of the parliament. So he's Bill again. <laughs> okay. Fingers crossed. Hey Bill. Hey Bill. Hey Bill. Hey Bill. <laughs> now the picture is good. Now how here we are a little oh. bit small screen but it works. Perfect. Yeah, this Perfect. is. This is I just cannot get that big. See, I have a very large screen, but it's very thin. And then the camera I have for it, it requires <laughs> thickness, and I just can't seem to get it adjusted. I have to figure out some way to do that. So I have to get my laptop over here. No problem, no problem. It's so, much better, I think. That's great. Yeah. Okay, so um, we'll uh, jump straight in. Uh, great. Uh, jump straight in. Um, so um, uh, you haven't met each other, so let me both introduce you to, to each other. So uh, we have coming from America, um, uh, Arkansas. Uh, we have uh, Professor William Elkins, and uh, he's uh, a professor in the University of Arkansas. Um, and uh, we have, from all the way from Tokyo, Japan, uh, we have Professor Ken Mogi, the Tokyo uh, professor, yeah. 
Tokyo Institute of Technology, and he's also a director of the Sony Computer Science Labs. And I'm uh, in um, Adelaide, uh, Australia, so this is a very international call. Um, <laughs> Makes it very important. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, um, uh, I know Professor Ken Moggy's uh, research very well because I've been reading his uh, papers for many years, and I know he's, I've seen many of his talks, and also know William very well. Um, and so I thought of a couple of topics which I think will be um, really interesting to talk about. Um, one one will be related to theology, uh, is to talk about the theoretical questions about God and religion. Um, but I'd like to start off with something uh, maybe a little bit easier to start off with, um, which is uh, 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 Chris Elkins. Um, William is uh, a, a great exponent of, of the Greek concept of parhesia, which is the f uh, freedom of speech. Um, oh, and, uh, uh, it's an ancient Greek, ancient Athenian uh, concept uh, that any, any uh, to totally free speech. So free speech wasn't invented in America, actually it was invented in, uh, in Greece, ancient Greece. I'm half Greek. Um, so, um, so related to this, we have the phenomenon uh, where uh, what, what is called, uh, maybe now called uh, uh, cancel culture, um, which may or may not be anti-free speech. Um, so we have it from ranging from uh, very significant things like Twitter banning uh, 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 President Trump when he in January, and right up to smaller things. You might have heard that five of Dr. Zeus's books, you know, the children's books, uh, <laughs> are being withdrawn uh, oh, because yeah. they, they don't fit into the uh, <laughs> you know current uh, culture. Um, and then there's a whole spectrum on, the, on, the, on that range of things, you know, like movies, um, m movies, um, you know, being uh, kind of banned from television. Uh, another case is a very, very famous director. Actually, I, I think he, he's a genius, Woody Allen. But he suddenly went from being a genius director to being uh, like uh, banned from television because, you know, he, now when you look back at his movies, they are maybe uh, not politically correct. <laughs> So, um, so the concept of parhesia in, in ancient Athens was, you know, total free speech. And I wonder whether we are seeing now um, a, a decline of free speech with this cancel culture or is, is, is cancel culture, you know, justified. So maybe start with um, William and then go to Chris Moggy. Yeah, yeah. Well, the comment I would offer to that is I'm a great fan of Frederick Hegel, who's really the father of modern philosophy. Uh, you know, he's, his dictum is generally thought of as thesis, antithesis, synthesis. And what that's really all about is how you, what happens when you create a binary and they're just two viewpoints. I'm right, you're wrong. The other side says, I'm right, you're wrong. And so we just sort of clash heads. In modernistic society, obviously, you know, there was open to debate, but you could clash through that to come, come to something. Hegel's entry into that said that when you observe, when you come in contact or observe a phenomenon, uh, statement, data, et cetera, our tendency is to go to whatever side of that we're inclined towards and that leads to the binary and the argument and so on and so forth however his recommendation for a resolution of greater understanding of knowledge was to pause because probably you're jumping subjectively into your own issues your own concerns etc cetera, etc cetera. And that's leading you to narrow what type of information you're really making available to yourself. Uh, therefore, my problem with the cancel culture is it's all read through the lens of your own personal subjective experience, usually race or ethnicity. And we're never going to solve problems in the bigger sense of the word if that's where we get stuck. Not that I have anything, I was a great proponent in the 60s of this, the integration movement and the, the rights of changing that, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, honoring and respecting all races and all peoples. But if we wanna make see everything through a particular lens, 
then we're not going to see a big picture of anything. And what we'll, we'll end up while we're trying to eliminate the other side of that we don't think is true, we're going to not come to the truth either. I'll offer that as a comment about <clears throat> this from a different perspective. Um, uh, um, I would like to reply and also maybe add a little bit. Is there cancel culture in Japan now as well? Not as much as in the US. Uh, as you know, Adrian, uh, Japan is not um, <clears throat> really a country where people are keen on you know, political correctness and so on. <clears throat> By the way, uh, William, uh, it's really nice to meet you. And, uh, and nice to meet you too. I've been looking forward to this. I'm always you know, uh, curious to meet with new people, but uh, I've already learned a lot from your short statement already. So I'm really enjoying this. And um, you know, about council culture, uh, Adrian, I, I think, you know, uh, you know, I study the neural system of human brain. And I, I think it is very important that we are exposed to many different ideas and opinions as we grow up. And then we can make a choice. Uh, you know, I am, I think, a liberal person more. So I'm for gender equality, for example. But, you know, having said that, uh, I think my opinion has been formed in my life through rule of history and uh, experiences. And I have met pe with people who are really uh, gender biased, like, you know, a typical Japanese middle-aged man would say things that would raise eyebrows in you know, many societies. But these men do have their opinion and they are you know, entitled to express their opinions, I think. And, you know, it's not like uh, when you are with that kind of a person, you are infected by him. I mean, it's, it's your brain is actually very good at making choices on your own, you know, um, initiative. And it, it actually, in order to train your brain, I think it is very important to have all a whole spectrum of ideas coming back to you. And you know, if you just narrow your uh, information diet, if you like, to a very a small band, then there is a danger that you might become too naive. And uh, when something new comes, you might right. be brainwashed very easily. That's the danger. So you know, I I do agree that um, Adrian, that you're concerned about uh, your council culture. For example, the Woody Allen films, which in my opinion are masterpieces. So whatever Mr. Aram might have done in his private life should be separate from the values of his works. And if some people would like to see his excellent works uh, eliminated from a uh, repertoire, that would be terrible because you know that would be saying that we should now just limit to this very narrow range of information as a brain diet. That is a very bad news for the overall health of the society and for our individual freedom. Um, so that's uh, my impression about this. Fantastic comment. Do you have any reply? Well, I would just add another comment that uh, parallels that. The uh, writer that really got my attention uh, in recent years about this is Foucault, the uh, French philosopher who's uh, been recognized, generally speaking today, as probably the most significant philosopher of the 20th century. And he gave a series of lectures at the College of, of, of France, a, a, a University of Paris. And he had a, this is so interesting in light of how council, what council culture is really doing. He, he, he used the word Parisia and in, and, and Discussing that, he said at one of the opening lectures, I think it was in 1984, uh, he said, rather than choose a, a philosophy of critical knowledge, I prefer to choose a philosophy uh, which gives me self-understanding as I'm open to myself. That's paraphrasing it to a bit. And with that, he went from there to discuss Parisia, which means free speech, saying what you freely feel, 
truth to power, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, what he was really saying is rather than coming up with something that is absolutely right, even though it's based on data and scientific evidence, I choose to embrace myself or embrace a system of thinking that enlightens me into myself and gives me more self-understanding and self-awareness, which you know is a never-ending life task to understand yourself. But if we have certain, you know, rules and regulations, so we say about what you can't think and what you have to think and so on and so forth, you rule that out and you become limited psychologically as a person, in, in fact, and certainly in your relationships. Right. So, uh, we, we have, uh, I have a, a specific question for you and perhaps Adrian. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, I have noticed this phenomenon when uh, when people are preaching the right thing, like gender equality and so on, sometimes it happens that that person is secretly in his or her own private life uh, doing something that is contrary to what he or she uh, publicly expresses. Like, you know, for example, um, maybe this is not an appropriate uh, case, but uh, uh, like, uh, for example, a Catholic priest preaching. Right. Yes, and so on, but right. children uh, behind, or you know, uh, those people who say, you know, um, idealistic things about men women relationship, but then secretly having a lot of you know mistresses behind and all these things. And right, so, right. But when you look at these cases, you realize that we are all human, nobody is right. perfect, and too much political correctness would probably, you know, kind of distort the person that we truly are, like Bill was saying. Uh, so, you know, you know, too much political connectedness would probably, you know, uh, keep us astray from our true self. So uh, I have one specific question I have is that in, I understand that in French media, uh, politicians' private life is off limits. I mean, they are not reported. For example, if a, the president has, uh, extramarital affair, that is his own private problem, but not necessarily a political problem. But I see in the United States, uh, or uh, English speaking world in general, I think, uh, there's this really uh, close scrutiny, if you like, of a politician's private life. And sometimes uh, his or her political career would be destroyed if something amiss would be you know, uh, discovered. And what do you think of this attitude in the American media, for example, about the private lives of Christians compared to the French attitude, which leaves this private <laughs> domain, you know, kind of- It's quite, quite different, the French compared to the American. <laughs> yeah. So it's what- inter To me, it's interesting how that becomes a convenient tool of uh, weaponizing politics. Uh -huh. We, we tend to only bring that out about someone who we uh, disagree with and want to diminish their power and influence politically, uh, as opposed to, you know, as opposed to, oh, well, okay, uh, they have a weakness there. And of course, it depends on how, how severe the, the, you know, the, the behavior is. Uh, uh, obviously, there are certain levels of behavior that you know, to a certain to a certain degree, that would be completely unacceptable if it's completely abusive and overly <clears throat> compulsive. But uh, I, I think that we tend to. <clears throat> I, I, I've uh, been very much involved in uh, certain aspects of the Christian faith, and I've discovered that very often it's really like people like to see their heroes fall. You know, the, the minute there's a the minute there's a weakness, well, uh oh. See, he wasn't the man he claimed to be, so another fallen hero. And uh, that doesn't leave room for a lot of grace and acceptance and self -under even self-understanding and acceptance. And that, that uh, to me, is a real issue here. Interesting, yeah. Adrian, yeah. do you have any? Yes, that's a very, yeah, that's an excellent, excellent question. I, I, I remember, you know, growing up as a, as a you know, as an undergraduate in university, um, that that was at that time at least uh, 
um, it must have been the late 80s, early 90s. At that time, it was very, very different because um, we had the case of uh, Bill Clinton, uh, <laughs> you know, being impeached for his, uh, uh, let's say, affair with um, Monica Lewinsky. If you, <laughs> that seems like such, such innocent times now. <laughs> We were getting impeached for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Innocent times. Um, but anyway, uh, if you remember the impeachment trial went to incredible detail about, you know, who did what and when when it happened and where it happened and, uh, you know, what dress was worn. And, um, <laughs> and, and, and at the time, uh, a lot of the media was saying, yes, if, if it was in France or maybe just even in Europe in general, no one would care less. I mean, and here is, uh, you know, what are these... Uh, uh, crazy Americans uh, impeaching a president uh, of, over this uh, relatively minor uh, matter. But um, I, 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 I think uh, what Bill is saying is correct. I think in, in politics and, and in life, uh, people enjoy to see the, uh, you know, uh, downfall of a great, great man or great woman. Um, you know, actually one of the books which, uh, which I think everyone reads in high school, at least in the West, is, you know, Thomas Hardy. Uh, you know, mayor of the mayor of Casterbridge, and that's just a classic story. It's just it's the downfall of a great man, and people love that. Um, so I think I think what Bill was saying is correct. People love bringing down bringing down great people, so they'll use any available means. Um, and and I think right now the let's say sexual means is the is is like the uh, the let's say the the uh, you know, the uh, nuclear weapon of, of this age, so to speak, to bring down people. Um, I suspect- just, By the way, just to, yeah. l let me share right. another situation that I don't think either one of you guys would be aware of, uh, but it's really in the news in Houston, Texas and in the sports world. Uh, and it just shows how far this can go. Uh, the Houston Texan professional football team has a quarterback named Deshaun Watson who's an outstanding uh, quarterback. Uh, there's a, been a lot of consternation with the franchise, the terrible ownership, leadership, et cetera, et cetera. Team has basically sort of fallen apart and the good players have also started saying they wanted out, including the quarterback. And they, they paid him a huge extended contract two years ago, et cetera, et cetera. So in the midst of this, are we going to trade him? Or are we going to keep him? The new ownership says we're going to keep him no matter what, et cetera, et cetera. This report started coming out two weeks ago about all these women who are accusing him of sexual abuse. Well, what, what are the accounts reported? Well, there are 14 of them. Almost every one of them is exactly the same and they all have to do with comments that he made while he was getting a private massage to the massage therapist. Now, you know, it's one thing if, <laughs> you know, if you're uh, making obscene gestures at, at uh, some, some woman, a staffer that you're working with, or if you're married and you're sneaking around behind your wife and being unfaithful, et cetera, et cetera. But in, in the privacy of a professional situation and a guy makes a comment, which he has apparently reportedly done several times and always the same kind of thing, that, that, that is so minor. And it, I mean, didn't touch, didn't touch them, didn't hurt, harm them, didn't force them, just suggested something basically and maybe a little more aggressive than that, but pretty much that. And so now it's like, oh, well, see, he's going to come under, he won't, he, there's no way he can be traded now because, because <laughs> nobody wants such a, such a bad person with under this, under this pressure from the league. And of course, the first time I heard of this, I thought, this is awful interesting timing when the franchise is trying to keep him and find some reason why he can't be traded uh, that all this begins to come out. But it's just the, what I'm saying is the extent of how far this goes uh, is, is really, and there's even a report that came out this week this, that this appears to be a, a very uh, hyped up situation just for that professional purpose of keeping him on the team and 
having some reason to not let him go. But yeah, it, it's, it's yeah. It just, yeah I'm oh, you offend you offend a woman, and yeah. no, oh, oh, you know, it's just the end of the world for you. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think all I don't think you ought to. I don't, please be clear. I don't think you ought to go around offending women, and yeah, if he, if he's doing that, he ought to be a little smarter for one yeah. thing as yeah, to yeah. what he's asking for and what yeah. he's trying to do and repeatedly. Yeah. But the extent of the response at this level is, uh, if he was a regular guy, it'd mean nothing, but because he's a professional quarterback and, you know, he's being paid you know, $20 million a year uh, and he's one of the best quarterbacks in the league. Well, this is, it's very important to bring this out publicly, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think all, all three of us, uh, you know, would agree about the equality of the sexes, but um uh, maybe, yeah, I mean, this has probably gone too far. And um, so I also want to say, Mogisan, I'm not sure because I haven't really followed the French news, but I suspect this is a zeitgeist and, uh, you know, right now and every country will, have, will, will essentially be the same. I mean, it started off in America with the uh, Me Too movement last year, but I suspect France uh, uh, will, will essentially be the same if, if, if not uh, already, because I think it's a kind of zeitgeist and with the internet, the, these movements uh, actually travel travel much faster around the world. So I suspect what we think about French politics maybe uh, soon or maybe already no longer apply because of the zeitgeist of this, uh, you know, the, the, this uh, uh, let's say movement that began with the Me Too. Uh, I'd like to also bring up something which is which is probably I'm not sure how well known it is in Japan, uh, Mogi San, but, uh, but definitely big in America. Andrew Cuomo, Governor Cuomo, uh, you know, last yeah, year. Last year in March, uh, when at the, at the height of the uh, pandemic and coronavirus pandemic in New York, I mean, he was a hero. He was like uh, uh, the golden, golden, golden man. And uh, people all over the world, uh, uh, all over America, even all over the world, I heard, uh, including me, used to tune in every day to hear his uh, uh, coronavirus update. And in fact, he won an Emmy Award for his news conferences because that was so widely watched. He was he was the greatest hero of all time. Just one year ago, uh, people were saying he's going to be the next president, probably. You know, um, and within eight days of a New York Times article, uh, you know, he's basically um, you know uh, uh, he, he's basically rock bottom. Um, and uh, again, as Bill said, these are not these are not what we thought about before. I mean, where you know maybe a man touched the woman or tried to fondle her, or even worse. This is, this is basically just comments that were made. Uh, and in fact, this kind of relates to our, our first question, right? So it is, it is, it is, a, it is really about speech. Um, so I think we might have come too far because now it's no longer about touching, a, a touching or, or inappropriately touching or even worse, which I, I think, you know, um, uh, uh, in, in the past, uh, for example, Bill Clinton, was impeached because he inappropriately had sexual relations. But now it's just about what what do you say? What do you say in the in 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 in, in the in the office in the meeting? Um, and and you know Governor Cuomo, I think it's another example of what Bill was saying. People love seeing the downfall of a great person. Right? So he was the hero of of the United States. Of, you know uh, uh, you know he was almost up there with Trump at one stage. Um, but he's now really really being brought down. And it was so fast. I mean, this New York Times article came out within eight days. I think all of the uh, Democratic leadership has called for his resigning or impeachment. Well, and the because curious thing about that it, it raises a an ethical uh, standard issue because the original uh, charge against Cuomo was the cover up of, about the reporting of the of the procedure and the deaths within the uh, retirement homes and how he created the order and brought people in and exposed them to COVID uh, to the rest of the uh, retirement home, et cetera, et cetera. Now that's very serious if what you did actually caused that was very careless and, and inappropriate from a uh, medical perspective, if you brought people in that were ill and should not have mixed them with other people that were vulnerable for that. And then you covered up the number of deaths and there was a, a, a crime, so to speak, and a cover up. But that's just completely gone away over the charges of this inappropriate behavior. 
Now, any type of a rational basis about ethics, the former is far more an important charge than the latter, but the latter has trumped the former to where that's almost not even discussed any further. And it's just all the more women we can say that, you know, he's been appropriate to is, is more reason to get rid of him rather than anything he really acted upon as a politician. So I, I think, you know, uh, character assassination is a really serious problem because, uh, for example, Adrian, uh, you also have been a victim of character assassination and character assassination happened when people see only a portion of somebody. I mean, when you look at the whole picture, uh, you have different opinions, but uh, when you just focus on one aspect of a person, like uh, Vir was saying, uh, of uh, Governor Cuomo, then you form a really un, you know, unbalanced, biased view of that person. And I see it happening every day, almost everywhere. So Adrian, uh, <laughs> sorry to bring it up again, but you, know, you have been a campaign, a victim of a campaign to deprive you of the Order of Australia uh, yes. title. Yes. Because of a thing that you said. But I have known you for so many years now, and I know how fundamentally a good person you are. But when character assassination happens, you know, uh, social media can, you know, go into this spiral of self justifying dynamics. And as Bill said, uh, the judgment can be very, very, you know, off the of her from the essential essence of the matter. So that is always happening. And I think that's one of the most serious existential risks, if you like, of modern society. Like in this great nation of the United States, uh, you know, free speech is great. Uh, you know, it's really nice to, for people to express his or her opinion. But when this, you know, spiraling of biased dynamics uh, go out of control, uh, it would mean a really substantial damage, not only to the person who is the victim of uh, past, you know, character assassination, but to the overall health of society. Uh, Edwin, you must have your personal experience about this, right? Yes. Character assassination. <laughs> <laughs> yes, unfortunately, um, I have. And uh, it, it, of course, uh, because I ran as a uh, politician in the 2019 federal election um, uh, in the Senator Fraser Annings party. And he was seen as a far right politician, uh, although I, I would argue he's not, he wasn't, he's not far right. But, you know, once, once I, 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 I feel people just see the, uh, just see the, the headlines, you know, um, pe pe people don't read the, the, the article uh, I mean, I th of course, people like us will read, you know, for example, the whole article in the, you know, New Yorker magazine or something. Um, but, um, but the, um, uh, but you know, people just read the the, the headlines, and uh, so, um, you know, so so people just thought, um, okay, you know, Adrian is a, Adrian is a is a fascist. He's a he's a neo Nazi. Uh, Etc. Um, and uh, so, uh, not only was there a camp, there was a very big campaign to to remove my uh, Order of Australia uh, award, um, and uh, uh, and and this was purely because people uh, labelled me as a, you know as a right wing, as a fascist, as a Nazi, which I absolutely am not a Nazi or a fascist. Um, but people like people just read the headline figure. And by the way, this wasn't just uh, in in Australia. This spread spread because you know the, the the newspaper which picked this up the most was the uh, Guardian newspaper, um, and uh, Guardian newspaper, of course, is, is from UK. So then uh, people in in uh, I, I worked before in the University of London. Well, they wanted they wanted me to go to a tribunal, and I went to a tribunal, and I you know tried to explain myself, uh, but they wouldn't take it. Um, and then I went to a second tribunal, uh, which basically was going to uh, dismiss me. But at that time, uh, I already had a very fantastic job in Malaysia as director of Imagineering Institute. And I said, well, you know, I, I don't care about your tribunal. I'm, I'm you know, I'm going to resign. I've, I've had enough of this. But 
you know, the 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 cancel culture uh, not is very much uh, in the public and and in academia. Um, but you know, I I I I, I thought Bill said some very interesting comment, which is people love to see the downfall <laughs> of a great man or a great woman. So although you know, Mogisan, we are great friends, and 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 you know, we 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 love each other, uh, and 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 but you know, I think the general public uh, and all people who really don't don't, don't know so well, I actually, uh, I'm not sure whether Bill would agree with this. I actually very very happy. When, when there is a downfall of a, of a, of, of a great man or a great, great woman. So, um, uh, so you know, Mogi-san, I think, I think this could happen to, um, to, to anyone, you know, uh, even to you. I mean, you are, I mean as far yeah, as sure. I can see, you do, you do everything correct. But who knows, one day you say one word out of line and... Uh, yeah, and uh, I'm, somebody might review, actually, I have a wig and on my head. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, so, so uh, uh, Arian, actually this I think would be very uh, nicely connected to the original uh, theme that uh, we plan, plan to discuss and which is uh, theology because, you know, you we should never forget that, for example, Socrates was um, a victim of character assassination uh, for which he had to die, you know, taking poison and also Jesus Christ also was a victim of character assassination, right? Because, you know, I, I remember the passage from the Bible that uh, Pirato, uh, I, I don't know how you pronounce it, uh, Pirato, is it? I, but anyway, uh, uh, he wanted to save Jesus at the last moment, but it was the people who wanted uh, to see Jesus down, uh, you know, um, it was people's decision at the final moment. So I, I think, you know, character assassination happens not only to uh, politicians, but also to a great philosopher, Socrates, and also a great religious guy uh, like Jesus Christ. So I think it's a very ubiquitous problem. I, I think that would probably lead to <laughs> the issues about theology and God and, uh, you know, and the things that you wanted to discuss originally, Adrian. Yes. In a way. So, so do, do you have yeah, any yeah, final yeah. comment yeah, on do. this topic before we move on? Well, yeah. I, uh, I yeah. left the screen for a moment because I went to get my books on Foucault. I was trying to find that yeah. particular quote, but uh, hold on one second. One thing I would add is, you know, uh, I thought I found it here. I'll keep looking. You know, this even starts with Plato, where yeah. as he, the, the great analogy of the cave, how, how, how does one come to understand the truth, which he saw yeah. a necessary characteristic of the good king. And it's like ascending out of the cave. You're in the complete dark and you're headed to the, the exit or entrance where you are the exit. And the, the more you move through the cave and up to the exit, the more first you see a glimmer of light and then you see more light and then you see more light and then you see, and you're finally in the middle of all the light. And his point was, that's how we come to understand truth. We see a little bit a glimmer of it. And then we keep looking and moving forward into that. And we see some more and we see some more. And finally we might see a whole spectrum of truth. And out of that, he, he, he uh, formulated the dialectic, which is the, the discussion among all the issues related, the aspects of the issues related to a subject. And if we lose that, according to Plato, we, we could never find the truth. And so if we capitalize on one single dynamic as the key ingredient of truth and anything outside the bounds of that, we, we'll never find the truth. Uh, and I found one really beautiful statement. It's not the one I was looking for by uh, Foucault uh, in his lectures in 83, 84, where he says, um, um, he's talking about Parisia, which is the concept that you raised. And he says, Parisia is the courage of truth in the person 
who speaks and who, regardless of everything, takes the risk of telling the whole truth that he thinks. But it is also the interlocutor's courage in agreeing to accept the truth that he hears. So it requires two parties. It requires someone who's willing to risk and speak his own truth. And that's where we actually from this get the term truth to power. But it also takes the willingness of the one spoken to to receive that and accept that as their truth. And if we don't have both of those dynamics at play in our culture, then, you know, I mean, this is the whole basis of the legal system was based on you have this side and you have this side. I say he's guilty. I say he's he should be acquitted. And they clash trying to find the truth and all the evidence discovery, et cetera, et cetera. And th th that's the whole basis of how the legal system works here. And it's an it's it's a support of this whole process of looking at all the possible facts and listening to them and considering from giving both sides free will to, to speak and present in order to come to the truth. And when we lose both halves of that, the listening, the speaking and the listening, we're 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 not we're gonna decide what the truth is arbitrarily. And that leads to, you know, huge problems philosophically. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Great. Well, um, so we, we, we went um, uh, way down a path, which is which is great. Um, so uh, I, was, I was just actually thinking, uh, uh, wouldn't it be great one day after the uh, coronavirus pandemic is over, we can meet somewhere, uh, have some glasses of red wine and uh, discuss for hours and hours. It would be yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Be I think that's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. great. So, great. so I'll go into the uh, second topic uh, because um, uh, Professor Elkins, uh, is a um, uh, professor, and he one um, he t he has a specialty in the theology, bi bi biblical literature, and Professor Ken Moggy is a specialist of the brain. And I had a question which uh, probably has been in my mind for a f maybe maybe more than ten years. I read the book by Richard Dawkins called *The God Delusion*, uh, which you maybe have read. Um, and essentially. Oh, well, the book is basically saying God is a delusion. But there, there is the question I had, uh, which is kind of implied in this book, is that um, uh, uh, God, uh, somehow the human brain uh, n naturally seeks uh, something to believe in uh, as, as to explain the unknown. Right. So my question is, is, is God a um, more of a uh, mental construct that, you know, our brains somehow manufacture something to explain what we what we don't know or is or is God actually real uh, so very deep question well I'll just offer a, a comment about that uh, you know I'm sure we've all been somewhat exposed to the arguments for the existence of God the ontological argument the theological argument the moral argument etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh really to me the value of all those arguments is they all point to something outside of ourselves that we can't it's not just this concept of god which is what the ontological argument is but it's that there are components about that that require a god that we see from different angles i think the best way to illustrate it though is why it's so you can't prove the existence of god but you can make a claim that it's necessary to make sense of reality for example, one of those arguments is what we call the moral argument. And the moral argument is simply that all men have the presence of morality embedded in their, in their consciousness and in the center of their being. And so we find that to be true in every single culture. Uh, obviously, you could go to an extreme religious culture, maybe extreme form of Christianity, or you could go to a, uh, a you know, a form where, you know, we've had more contem in contemporary society ethics that, you know, things are much more relative and yet still there, there's a basis of finding that there's, that there's right or wrong. But if you go even as far as to a, a cannibalistic society, you know, they, and, which violates any principle that we believe in about eating human beings, 
they believe it's wrong to eat your own family. So there's not a culture that doesn't exist, a culture that exists that doesn't have some ethical basis to it. The question becomes, where does that come from in that component? Well, it points to something that's in all of us that seems to come from something outside of us. And when we study religion, we discover while it's spirituality, there is a component of morality in it that's uh, part of the structure of what God is. So I would offer that as a, as a, as a thought about how we come to understand who God is and how we can uh, see that he's really necessary to our existence rather than just a construct. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting argument about you know, uh, showing the existence of God. So what do you think, Mogisan, from your point, you're a brain scientist, yeah, beautiful. Uh, first, let me say that I'm not really resonant with these people who say they are atheist and being an atheist is, uh, you know, uh, the only possible position of an intellectual today. I, I, I find it really, really trivial to say that. I mean, you know, it's, there are more to the idea of God than that. And, you know, uh, Adrian, you brought up this book uh, by Richard Dawkins, uh, The God Delusion, in which he claimed more or less, uh, you know, in related to Bill's comment, uh, that he said that, Richard Dawkins said basically that in order to explain the origin of morality, we don't have to resort to religious ideas. We just uh, need to explain them in ev evolutionary terms, you know, evolutionary biology or evolutionary psychology would take care of the origin of all the morality uh, that we have, actually have, like not harming your neighbor or, you know, altruism, all these things could be explained in terms of evolutionary biology. That was, I understand, Richard Dawkins' uh, fundamental idea of the book. But, uh, but I, 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 at, at the same time, you know, I study the brain and I, my lifelong goal is to understand the origin of consciousness so in our conscious experience, we do have this feeling of morality, right? Uh, when we do something bad, we have this feeling of guilt, which as you say, might be a brain construct, but to say something is a you know, construct of the brain uh, it has, has actually no information uh, to the reality of things because you know, of course everything is a construct of the brain. So it's a statement that is true, but at the same time, does not provide any additional information to that. Uh, the fact that we have a feeling of morality could be explained away by evolutionary biology to some extent, but that doesn't actually add any new information, so to speak, uh, to the fact that we do have feelings. We have joys, we have fears, and we have uh, regrets, and uh, uh, regrets are really vivid and real and you know you know to just try to explain in a way a feeling of morality uh, in terms of evolutionary biology or in terms of uh, brain circuit dynamics uh, as usual I have my <laughs> <laughs> you have your brain there <laughs> yeah so you know of course we have these uh, you know uh, emotion related circuits like uh, amygdala or, or you know the limbic system. Of course, they have something to do with morality, but to explain morality in terms of the dynamics of these circuits, it's so trivial. I mean, it's nothing intellectually challenging, if you like. And I think the really, really interesting and really intellectually challenging issue actually uh, is still with the fundamental fundamental aspects of religion. And, you know, Bill, I always felt that there are many kinds of geniuses, like Albert Einstein has been my hero for all the years. And uh, I tend to regard geniuses in physics at the highest level and right. Nobel Prize winners in biology uh, or medicine, like here. <laughs> physics, medicine, uh, that's my own bias. But uh, for me, uh, the really true genius is a religious genius. I mean, you know, who somebody who comes up with, with a totally 
new way to explain the origin or foundations for morality and values. And uh, in history, there are many, uh, there are quite a few people like, you know, I have an uh, image of the Buddha here. Uh, it's, uh, okay. it's an antique, uh, maybe it's 200, 300 years old. Oh. Um, maybe Buddha is, was one of these uh, religious geniuses. And I tend to regard religious genius at the highest level. So religious genius, <laughs> physics, and <laughs> medicine or biology. Uh, that's my bias. <laughs> anyway, what do you think? <laughs> I'm just, no. Well, I, I do think that's, uh, that's quite true because the, from one angle, uh, th theorist, which if you're if you're creating and promoting, developing uh, spiritual ideas, ethical, philosophical, etc., uh, that requires a, a rare gift of thinking to be able to be unique in that field. And certainly, uh, Buddha was that way. Uh, Jesus was certainly that way, living in an era. I'm doing a study uh, currently on Paul, the Apostle Paul's mysticism, which interestingly enough, <laughs> it, and I say it every week when I, when I lecture on it, uh, the church just kind of, you know, they, they know that the only reason the Gentile church is, the church is not purely Jewish is because the Apostle Paul came along and reshaped the whole thing after his conversation with the Messiah on the road to Damascus. And yet he's the last person that the church reads because he's rather difficult to understand, but he's difficult to understand because his ideas are so unique. Uh, the whole concept of in Christ, which is his signature term is a mystical term because it's, it's not, it's not a concrete action or a concrete statements you can argue for it's it captures an experience that transforms one's person one's self-image on a very psychological level but at the same time it's very spiritual and frankly <laughs> that's a little hard for a lot of people to grasp onto uh, because paul was a genius and he's speaking at that level jesus kind of showed his geniuses as he argued with the pharisees and explained you know what the law really meant as, and what real spirituality and religion is compared to what they had created, which was so reductionistic uh, and, and, and pedantic. But anyway. Yeah, Bill, that, that's, that's a wonderful that's, example. Well, yeah. Of course, a guy that doesn't have any mathematical and scientific skills, I would agree with you. I think they're much smarter than anybody in my field. <laughs> so Paul was the founding father of the Catholic Church, right? I mean, he was- Of the general, as a gen, of, you know, Christianity started out in Jerusalem with the disciples that Jesus had uh, taken under his wing uh, before he, death and resurrection and departed. Peter, James, John, they were all Jewish. And so when the church started in Jerusalem, it was a Jewish church. But uh, when Paul came along and was, uh, intercepted so we, he was a devout jew you know one of the leading rabbis in his in his era uh you know the messiah intervened on the road to damascus where he was going to kind of eliminate this cult of people following jesus as the messiah and said why are you persecuting me well what do you mean i'm, I'm not persecuting you i'm after these people that don't understand what this religion is really all about but he raised a very interesting point there, which is there's a principle of identification where the Messiah says, I identify with you and you identify with me. And that's what makes this spiritual and transformative. It's our understanding of who we are in relationship to who you are. So that really a person grows not by doing or knowing, but by you know, understanding the depths of that concept and what all that involves that was very transformative. Quite interesting because, you know, the arguments put forward by atheists like Richard Dawkins, of course, they make sense at one level, 
but at the same time, I always feel that they are so trivial. I mean, it's something that is logically very simplistic. And for me, uh, for example, this, uh, you know, uh, Bill, you are expert on this, but uh, this concept of trilogy, uh, sorry, trinity, sorry, trinity is really interesting. Uh, the trinity of God and Holy Spirit and Son of God, was it? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just- Right, uh, right, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This, this is very original and really deep and uh, really non-trivial to understand. Also, this concept of Virgin Mary, uh, you know, this is also very interesting. I mean, you know, of course, biologically speaking, it doesn't make sense. Right. But, uh, but it deep down from, from, uh, from a psychological perspective, it is very resonant and it is very significant. So when atheists say, oh, it's a ridiculous idea, it's a nonsense, you know, how could the Virgin conceive Christ? I mean, that's true biologically, but it's so superficial, it's so trivial. I mean, it, uh, for me, it feels that these arguments do not touch the core of what religious thinking is. And, you know, uh, <laughs> How, well, it's, it's it's very interesting to me that you go to the concept of the Trinity, yeah. because it actually is a is a representation and solves the great problem of Middle Ages philosophy, uh -huh. as what's called the problem of the one and the many, or individuals and particulars. You know, Occam and these guys went back and forth. Is there only if we say man, do we mean all men or one? Or are we talking about all individual men and there's no unity among the individual men? But the Trinity espouses both, which is, ne which is necessary to have one and many, to have individuals and, and unity of multiplicity. When you think about that politically, if you simply have one, everything is one, you have that leads to communism. If you have simply individuality, you have democracy run amok by the majority of the tyranny of the 51% vote. But if you have one and many together, you have a sense of individuality and the value of that individuality, but all that in the consideration of the wholeness of that group of people together and what they represent. And so while the Trinity sounds like a very ethereal sort of nonsensical concept to a lot of people, it really represents a, a very fundamental, a necess again, come back to the philosophical word necessary, necessary philosophical dynamic to make life make sense and the way it has to operate. Well, well Bill, I, I have to take your course at the university. <laughs> a student. That's, that's it. I, I listen, I'm very, I have a background in psychology as well. I was a practicing therapist for uh, a number of years. Oh, who are you? <laughs> very I'm very fascinated with the mind. So I, I'm already written down. I'm going to research some, for five, read some of your writings at this point, because I'm always interested to learn anything I can about the mind. Adrian, this is great. Yeah. I enjoyed it <laughs> really. Right, so we have good, uh, good match, Adrian. Yeah. yeah, I like I like bringing uh, great, great, great minds together. So you're both great minds. Um, we have about 25 minutes uh, before we finish. So to move on to the next topic, I wanted to discuss. Uh, it seems to me, from uh, observation, that Western religion, <clears throat> if you look at Christianity uh, and also Judaism, um, Western religion tends to be. I'm not sure where where Islam would come in, maybe it's in between East and West, but Western religion tends to be focused about there is one God, a single God, um, even, you know, the, even the, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit is uh, somehow explained as one God still. So Western Trinity religion, God, but one God, yes. Uh -huh. yeah, Trinity, but one God. Uh, so Western religion seems to be focused on one God. Uh, before, a long time ago, if you look at ancient, you know, Germany, ancient <laughs> Finland, they had paganism where they had many, many gods. But it seems to me that in modern times, Western religion focuses on having one God and Eastern religion, including in Japan, uh, tends to focus on having many gods. Um, so what do you think is the reason of this kind of 
a big difference between East and West in terms of religion? Hmm, that's a yeah, good yeah. question. I'd like to hear Ken's response to that first. Oh. As, a, as an Easterner. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, in Japan, we say that there are 8 million gods and 8 million is actually infinity. So uh, traditionally in Japan, uh, we, you, we tend to think there are many gods. And that's why uh, Japanese people actually, this might surprise you, Bill, but uh, maybe you know, uh, it's quite typical for Japanese people to uh, have a wedding in the Christian style because they think it's fashionable. And they do the funerals in the Buddhist style. You know, um, so we do not do funerals in Buddhist style when somebody dies. And on the New Year's Day, uh, we go to the Shinto shrine and pray okay. to God. So we have, it's quite typical. So we, a typical Japanese do not have, uh, does not have a problem in mixing religion together. And okay. <laughs> that's probably due to the fact that traditionally Japan used to have this idea that eight, there are 8 million gods. Interestingly, there's this another image of Buddha. And <laughs> when Buddhism came into Japan, uh, it was merged with the Shinto religion. So uh, until the major restoration when Japan modernized and you know, uh, incorporated many ideas from the West. There were no problem for Buddhism and Shinto shrine, Shinto religion okay. to coexist. So I think that's very different from the Western approach where you always quarrel each other with each other. I mean, even with, with uh, between different sects in Christianity, I understand there have been always right. battle. And so that's, I think, very different. From well, I think what, what I can represent here is I think number one, I would offer a couple of different uh, perspectives here, a couple of different dynamics. First of all, really, when one looks at the whole of Christianity, it was, as I was mentioning a minute ago, it was really founded in and grew out of the Hebrew religion. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a religion of the East. Oh, very symbolic, very poetic. Uh, the concrete aspects of it had to do with uh, duty to the law and obedience to religious behavior. But the interesting part of that is those aspects of their requirements religiously are they're much more, the, the problem that's created, uh, for example, if you go back and you read uh, the mythology of the, of the Canaanite cultures and uh, other cultures surrounding Israel, is their mythology presents gods that don't really have a consistent ethical standard. You know, uh, th these mythologies that offer you know, this God killed this God and this God got drunk and went over and created a war with this God and tore out their, their stomach. And that created the, you know, this, et cetera, et cetera, uh, is in comparison to Yahweh, the God of the old Testament, who is righteous in the sense that he has a consistent ethical standard. Uh, that's what righteousness means. It means consistently you can depend on, uh, his consistency and uh, hopefully big message of fairness and justice and grace in applying that uh, ethical standard. But the religion as a whole is, is much more, you know, uh, something that's been said, if you want to see what a Jew believes, you follow him around and see what he does. If you want to know what a Gentile Christian believes, you sit down and talk to him and let him present his reasons. Um, and with that, I think part of the problem of the, of the, I don't know if we want to call it uh, rigidity or sterileness of this often true in, in the modern uh, Western American Christianity or even European Christianity is, I just take it back to what we were discussing a minute ago. It, it's made a more of a, a, a rationalistic, ethical, 
system rather than a spiritual system, which again, really to me misses the whole point of what the New Testament uh, Gentile mixed church Christianity is all about as Paul expresses it being in Christ. Uh, and there really is a, an explanation of God is there for everyone to grasp and they're responsible for responding to the, seeing the understanding of the truth of the creator rather than simply having a, a doctrinal formula that, you know, is the only aspect of, of the faith. So, you know, it's, uh, I'd have to, that's a good question. I have to think more about it as to why it's structured in the West as opposed to the East, except that the West, when the church went to, when Paul went to the Gentiles and started the Western church, it began to take on a Western culture. Uh, um, <clears throat> now there's tremendous amount of Christianity in Africa, which is not exactly the East, but it's not exactly either a Western, a Western form of Christianity either. Uh, so I don't know. I, you know, I have some, speaking of Japan, I have some very dear friends and you're talking about weddings that I married that are both Japanese in Aspen, Colorado. And uh, they became the founders of a very prominent uh, restaurant. Uh, the husband, Takish, uh, is, a, is a third generation sushi chef and they have a restaurant in Vail, Colorado. And I think one in California called Osaki's that is a five-star, really very prominent, almost international restaurant. And they're very good friends of ours. So that's a good question. Maybe I ought to ask them that as well to get their perspective. Uh, but that was a very wonderful relationship my wife and I formed with them when we were in Colorado. And they actually, uh, we became very good friends trying to help them as they restructured their life from what they were doing until they could create their own restaurant. But uh, that's a very good question as it why it's located where it is and taking the shape it does. Great, great. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'd like to jump back to Richard Dawkins again. Um, I think also other people have similar have said similar things. But um, one of the one of the, the questions Dawkins and others had is um, he if you are a, he says that if you are a scientist or maybe intellectual in general, uh, you know following logical things, um, there's no way that you can be religious. So, because religion cannot be proved with scientific steps. So what do you think about the, uh, what, what do you think about it? Is, is it possible to be an intellectual slash in, or a scientist and also religious at the same time? Is it possible? Well, one of the most interesting Christian philosophers that I know of, uh, is a man who created a organization called Reason to Believe. And he grew up in an atheistic family, but uh, when he was a young adult, he didn't go to church, et cetera, et cetera. When he was an adult, he was in a personal crisis and he happened to pick up a Bible and he read, he was a, a physicist by training. And he read the first chapter of the book of Genesis. And I, I, I do not have the capacity to explain the particulars about it, but he said, once I read the first chapter of Genesis, I said, this is an exact representation of what must have taken place in creation. So I believe this book is true and authentic. Now he's a, he's a physicist and he's created a, phil a Christian philosophical organization uh, that offers, you know, explanation, support, et cetera, for such things. But um, somebody like that would have a whole different perspective. That again is where you, I'm just going to discount anybody that claims to to have faith in Christianity is uh, they don't have any proof of it. But I think there there uh, there is a whole branch of people that are scientific, even at a high level like that, that will tell you exactly the opposite. So I couldn't explain all their particular explanations of reality from physics and how that matches what we see in, in, in the Christian religion and the Hebrew religion, even in the creation stories, but to them, it's there. Mm. What do you think, Morrison? 
you know, I, I tend to think that uh, even if you're a scientist, you can have uh, what you would call a uh, sense of wonder at the, this miracle of uh, existence, you know, uh, when scientists say that the universe is, uh, you know, this much old and the earth is this much old and, uh, you know, biological forms uh, have evolved in it. And, you know, that's all, all okay. And that is what Richard Dawkins can say. But at the same, at the same time, we do have this remaining sense of wonder at the marvel that we are. I mean, the fact that we have began this conversation about an hour ago, but now um, our past, and we can never go back to the point where we first met Bill. And you know, this, you know, this enigma that is our existence cannot simply be explained away by scientific method. You know, even Einstein admitted that uh, his theory of relativity can't explain the fact that there is now in time, you know, that special significance of the now, you know, now we are now, but now then now will be the past and the future will be the now. This passage of time is completely uh, uh, out of, you know, uh, the range of scientific explanation. So yes, science can explain a lot of things, but the miracle of our existence cannot be explained away by simple, you know, scientific method. And those people who claim that science can explain everything are intellectually dishonest, I think. If you are really honest, mm -hmm. you would you admit that there are many things beyond science. So yeah, of course we can, you know, still be a deeply spiritual religious person, even if you are a scientist. And that is, you know, Bill, yeah. <clears throat> Well, in my field of rhetoric, it is well recognized from the early onset and modern rhetoric that the whole uh, dynamic of human speech is a miracle unique to nature, which it's hard, if, if not impossible to explain, meaning this, uh, Kenneth Burke, who's a leading American rhetorician, said that all language is symbolic. In other words, if I say chair, that word is actually a symbol of something that I'm sitting in. If I'm a Hispanic, I have a totally different, well, I don't say chair, I say, uh, what is it, cita? I'm not sure, but I can't think of the word for chair at the moment, even though I used to know Spanish. But that's another symbol. Those words are symbolic and represent something. So early rhetoricians, and we often begin our courses on rhetoric by explaining that human language is a miracle in the sense that if you look at nature, it's a very clear, well-established fact that human beings are the only form of creation that actually can communicate in symbolic words in a sense that is understandable by the rest of the race. Where does that come from? Well, a baby is born. He always says is goo goo and ba ba. And he has a home or a family that he grows up around. And then he's saying war, he's saying symbols, dada or mama or papa, whatever whatever language he's in and they use the symbols. So how does, how does he get there? You know, and how is it that he understands what those symbols mean and use them in a way that's effective in communication? That's unexplainable. It's a miracle as to how we can, but you know, you talk to your dog and the best he can do is bark back at you. I have a cat that talks to me which is pretty amazing for a cat. Every time I walk in the room, she says hello to me. Ow, ow. Or if she wants something, she comes over and rubs up against and goes, ow, ow. And I say, what do you want? And you have to figure it out. So a human being, you say, well, put dinner on, right? <laughs> so it, it, that's a, a, re, a reality. And some of the uh, 
leading right rotations are not necessarily religious people. Uh, in fact, one of the leading ones is, is very much of an atheist, but still we, uh, it has to be admitted that this concept of human speech in, in comprehensible symbolic language being unique to creation and nature itself is, uh, you know, it, it points to something else that's going on in, in the world that is bigger than who we are. And, and our processes of understanding. Yeah, wonderful. Um, you know, uh, for me, uh, the you know mystery or foundations of language is actually is equal to the mystery or foundations of consciousness. So, right. Because, so, so I, I agree totally. Agree. So, when people uh, make arguments from atheist point of view, like Richard Dawkins does, I mean, he he's depending on language and. He's expressing his views on language, but the very fact that he's able to do that is something beyond our present understanding of the world. I mean, you know, because of artificial intelligence, people are claiming, are starting to claim that they have natural language within, you know, their, you know, um, skill. Uh, they can process natural language, but that, that is false, totally false. I mean, you know, artificial intelligence systems like. GPT-3, uh, the, the way they handle language is completely different from the way we handle language. And nobody has a clue. Nobody has a clue how language wow. is possible, so. Right. Yeah, there, there are mysteries in life that have to be understood, that are not adequately addressed and understood by our systems of rationality and our, our systems of gathering information, whether they be scientific or philosophical or psychological. So Adrian, as a roboticist, do you have something to add to that and um, this language embodiment program? Well, yes. I mean, uh, honestly speaking, as a as a engineer, electrical engineer, you know, ro ro robots are basically engineering devices. So uh, I don't think engineers can really understand the the, the root of the uh, of, of of the language learning. I mean, of course, we can train a computer to you know recognize sounds. Uh, you know, and, and do maybe, you know, like Google can recognize your voice, uh, you know, uh, or Alexa. Um, but it's a, it's, a very, it's a very logical thing. It's just basically pattern matching, you know, pattern matching of sound to, uh, you know, some, some action. Um, but I think what, uh, uh, Moki san what you're saying, uh, you know, about, about the, the, the language is some, somehow fundamental to the brain development. Uh, at a very, very fundamental level, you know, even forming the circuits of the brain, um, that doesn't really, uh, you know, for, for a robot, the circuits don't change, you know, it, there's these microchips, they're not going to change, but the software changes. But I think what Mogi and you're saying is that the, the hardware itself changes as, as we grow up uh, and learn language. And I think what Bill's saying is that the learning of language itself, the, uh, um, the, the understanding of patterns is somehow uh, a sign of a higher being, a higher God, uh, the, the fact that humans do this, what Bill's saying that this itself is a sign of a, of a higher God. So, uh, you know, I, I, I agree with both of you. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think engin engineers have much to contribute to this topic because it's too logical uh, engineering. <laughs> yeah. Great. So, um, uh, yes, unfortunately, it's been a fantastic discussion. It's gone so fast, but we Unfortunately, coming to the uh, end of the time. So I'd like to maybe end off with uh, maybe you have some concluding thoughts, uh, concluding statements you'd like to say uh, uh, to, um, uh, to wrap up today's session. So I'm um, not sure who wants to go first. <laughs> well, I'll, maybe okay. I'll pick then. Uh, Mogisai, why don't you go first? <laughs> oh. Well, uh, Adrian, thank you for this wonderful opportunity, and uh, I hope there will be many repeats of this session. Uh, you know, when we discuss, um, I have this extraordinary feeling that we are actually sharing a lot of things, you know, background knowledge, background worldview, if you like, and what we speak is actually a tiny, tiny portion of that. But when we exchange words, we feel that uh, we are actually touching on some iceberg. Only we can only touch the tip of it, and so that's the exactly that's the exact feeling that I had uh, in discussing 
with Bill uh, and Adrian, and um, I was moved by the fact that uh, there are people like Bill uh, in the States who is always thinking about these things and um, has developed this deep thought and life is short and we can never reach there. But the fact that we always strive to come to an understanding is a great testimony of the human spirit and uh, that this has been great. I, Bill, I have a fa factual question actually to you. Okay. You, you teach students, right? So I'm just, right. you, uh, I'm just curious how the young generation in this age are uh, attracted to this kind of topic, theology, you know, how, because in, in a, we are living in a zeitgeist uh, of very practical a lot of money, uh, right. startup uh, CEOs and all these people, but there are students who would come to you for these questions. So how th is that possible? I mean, what these, are these young people are seeking from you? And do you have any okay. questions on that? Well, most of the young students that I teach, I teach it in common. But I would say, even as I interact with those students and understand the culture in this age bracket, and three children of my own that are no longer children, they're boys, their youngest one is in his mid thirties and the oldest in his mid forties. But uh, they're really seeking not for a religion, but they're seeking for some spiritual reality that is meaningful and offers transformation to their own personal lives that gives it purpose and, uh, you know, actuality, shall we say, and helps actualize them. Um, so I, I, I find, and that, that's what I'm so excited about having made this discovery the last several years about uh, mysticism really being at the true heart of Christianity, because whether you're dealing with, uh, you know, the, the problem in Germany and Nietzsche coming forward, criticizing the church and that whole romantic movement, trying to get the church out of this uh, dogmatic, uh, dead orthodoxy, or you're just dealing with kids today who look at religion and just think it's a, a political system and a bunch of right and wrong for people that want to, you know, be self-righteous. Uh, they're really at the heart of it is a spirituality. And, I would expand that concept by saying that, you know, when I was uh, back in college and really seeking for truth, what I discovered is I was exposed on one hand to Christianity and on the other hand to humanities, philosophy, uh, psychology, history, et cetera, that I discovered that there was a match, a, a synchronism between the real truths uh, that you can find within the, the Christian scriptures and in the realities that people are seeking for and claiming individually in these other fields of philosophy, psychology, et cetera. Really, all, all truth is God's truth. And to me, when something is uh, accurate, it generally matches a principle, not necessarily a statement or a verse, but a principle that I think is embedded than the nature of Christianity, Hebrew Gentile Christianity, uh, and in the scriptures, but you know, matches some reality of life itself. And so it's really the transformation power of Christianity that's appealing to me and the, the truth that it offers in that regard. Hmm. Great, thank you. Great. So Bill, thank you so much. And Bill, so do you have a concluding uh, comment or statement for today? Truth to power. <laughs> let's, okay. let's go back to the beginning and uh, let's affirm Parisia and the need to be both speakers and listeners to all truth, uh, always following uh, Hegel's dictum to pause and reflect before we react to see to it that we get the whole truth and not just the only part of it that seems to be naturally important to us. Yep. Well, that's a fantastic way to end. So we had a, uh, I think it was, I think everyone agreed it was a fantastic intellectual discussion and uh, 
Um, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to meet again. I'm sure we could discuss for hours and hours. Oh, this was, this was wonderful. You had a wonderful idea here, and <laughs> I appreciate it. I think you, you uh, match us up both well. And uh, I mean, I had no idea what to expect, but I knew it would be good if it was coming from you. So <laughs> thank very you. Enjoyable. So it's, it was so, so great to speak to you, two, two of you great minds. So thank you today. Uh, thank you, Professor Ken Mogi from Japan. Thank you, Professor William Milkins from USA. Um, have a good morning and good night in USA. Thank All you. Right. And Ken Soli was nice to get to know you a bit this evening. Yeah. Look, um, nice much pleasure. more of it. It was, uh, pretty, uh, it was an honor to meet you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank and you very much. Good night. Thank so you. should we leave now? Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you now. Thank you. Bye-bye.